um, today um, I, have, I have a lot of material to present. There's no lab today, so Great. yes. Yeah. There's um, a lab schedule tomorrow, though. And I have a head off of that. I'll give that out later. Um, so yeah, I have a lot to get through, so you can be ready for tomorrow's lab. And uh, this is um, the bronchial tree. And I've always wondered why they call it a tree. It's the bronchial system of the trachea and the larynx. So if you turn it upside down, I guess it looks like a tree. The whole point of calling it a tree is to teach students how it branches out all the divisions. There's something like 23 or 24 divisions. So how you can study the bronchial tree, the conducting airways, and um, studying the divisions. When you go through it, you can count the divisions, 1 to 24. We won't go through every single one. We'll kind of skip some. But you have to think about what you're doing as you go through them, the structures you're studying. If you're studying airways to deliver fresh air to your alveolar spaces. That's the, whole, that's the whole point. I think you already got that. And so, and, and along the way, this is anatomy, we kind of have to talk about, well, how do the airways change? You start with one airway. And, it, and with each division, you increase in number, but the size decreases. Okay, so we'll try to keep a track of all those structural changes as we go along. But before the airway divides, call that division zero, you have one trachea. Um, let's see here. Well, oh, no, this is not. here we go. We have one trachea. Now the trachea we got one. Oh, sorry. Trachea is a singular structure, and it's only four inches in length. And it's about two and a half centimeters in diameter. When that airway divides, the last tracheal ring is called the carina. It's made out of cartilage. I'll call it a cartilage ring. But throughout its length, there's, there's many cartilage rings. They're all C-shaped. C-shaped. Cartilage rings. One of the last things we talked about was the tracheal wall in the last lecture. Um, as air reaches um, the bronchi, air is warmed to cleanse of its impurities. The bronchi will then divide into secondary and tertiary. So we're going to divide. And as we divide, um, these larger airways we call bronchi. Okay, Just call the trachea the trachea. So let's get to this slide here. And so this is showing you the larynx on top with the trachea uh, right below it. It's four inches long. Remember, four inches is only like this, right? I mean, these big slides make it seem like we have draft necks. Uh, it's only four inches from larynx to uh, where it divides here at the carina, the last tracheal ring. I call this the underpants. It looks like underpants. It was the last one. Where it divides, you get your first division. One airway, the trachea, your first division, divides into two primary bronchi. So you get two primary and each division gets smaller. So, so maybe these are, you know, um, one centimeter, you know, in terms of diameter. I won't refer to length, I'll just refer to diameter. And the two airways, these primary bronchi, they're called primary bronchi because it's the first division. 
we refer to them individually, you have one left main bronchus, you have one right main bronchus. So these conducting airways, think of them as what are they delivering the air to? They're conductors of air, and each of these are delivering air to the left lung and to the right lung. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just going to write deliver air to left or right lung. It's not hard to deduce which does what, right? Oh, the left main bronchus delivers air to the right lung? No, of course not. The left main bronchus delivers air to the left lung, and same thing for the right. So basically, I mean, they, they show it here, right? They put a little lasso around it. But notice there's a difference in shape. It looks like the left main bronchus is a little longer. I put this picture here to remind me to point out that you have the artery. The aortic arch kind of goes over um, the left main bronchus. The right main bronchus is kind of more in line with the vertical trachea. So in terms of a clinical significance of a small child gets a little peanut or coffee bean down there, it's more likely to fall to the right and become lodged in there. The right main bronchus is more in line with the trachea. More in line with the trachea. more likely to become obstructed. All right, so moving on, that's the first division. The second division, um, here's the first division. I just use arrows to point to the airways. So one airway becomes two airways. We have two primary bronchi. And there's the carina where they divide point to that. And so here's the second division in blue arrows. You got five airways now. So with the second division, two airways become five airways. <clears throat> so we can call them secondary bronchi. Second division, we're going to get five secondary bronchi. You can also call them five lobar bronchi. Because each of these airways, each of these five airways, is delivering fresh air to a lobe of a lung. Each deliver fresh air to a lobe of a lung. We have five. We have two on the left, three on the right. They have individual names. Just, just call all each of the five lobar bronchi or secondary uh, bronchus. You'll be fine in terms of identification. So I tried to point to them and just to show you that there's two on the left, three on the right for a total of five. Then they divide again. Okay, and uh, let's see. So we can kind of like where they divide the third time. Now they're colored here for this picture. So for the third division. Uh, you have something like 19 or 20 of these airways, depending on which book you read. Um, could be generic, something like 20-ish. So the third division, 
five airways become like about 20 airways. And they're called tertiary growth. Because, you know, tertiary, like third, you know, so first, second, third, tertiary bronchi. Um, they're more commonly referred to as um, segmental bronchi. Mm -hmm. Segmental bronchi, in each of these 20 of them, basically you're delivering fresh air to a segment of a lobe, and it's color coded, so you can see. Each airway. Delivers fresh air to a segment of a lobe. So the color code is, you know, this blue delivers to this part of this lobe and you don't have to memorize the segments, just the concept. You're delivering fresh air to a segment of a lobe. And um, so this is kind of like, you can still count them. The numbers haven't increased too much yet. We went from one airway, 20, okay? And after the first division, that's when the airways disappear into the lung tissue and you, and you can't see the airways anymore. The idea of a bronchopulmonary segment is useful for surgeons. I've been told that if you need to remove lung tissue, maybe, maybe due to cancer or something, you can use the bronchopulmonary segment as a useful anatomy tool to remove a whole segment. Because what you get is you get the lung tissue, you get the airway, you get the blood supply, and you get you know the nerve. Everything's there in one package for the surgeon to remove and get everything. Um, anyways. Moving on. To continue on, so far, through all these divisions, we're just conducting the air. We haven't had any gas exchange yet. The goal is for us to study it all the way down to the respiratory zone where we do get gas exchange, which is deep in the lung tissue, way down here is the respiratory zone. We're like way up here. Do you see what they did to kind of see that the respiratory system is a dead end? They pruned away all the branches at each division. So it's just easier to visualize from top to bottom there. And uh, so what we've been talking about so far is number one, bronchus. Larger airways are called bronchus. They are shrinking a little bit. Notice how the cartilage, does it look like it's getting more or getting less cartilage as you go down? Less. less. So as you, say for example, get to here, you started off with the trachea, the, the Cartilage was like C-shaped. Now it's more like cartilage plates. You're decreasing the amount. Decrease cartilage. Now it's like here you have cartilage plates, have cartilage plates. The airway was started off as like, you know, something like two and a half centimeters. So these airways may be something like a half, half centimeter, call it five millimeters. In diameter. Yeah, I'm always going for the diameter. So you are getting smaller, but okay, after the third division, they start to get too many to count. Um, so let's just go. Let's just go to like three all the way to 10, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All of those categories, you, they're called sub-segmental bronchi. Sub-segmental. In terms of numbers, when you get to like, say down here, you get something like 40,000 airways. And maybe they're one millimeter in diameter. They call them all sub say segmental bronchi. So we 
go from one array to 40,000, and they're still called bronchi. These are considered the conducting airways, uh, the conducting zone, so to speak. On the figure, conducting zone is number three, where you conduct air, but there's no gas exchange. Okay, well, the next big thing is um, you get to like around the 11th division. Again, it depends on book you're reading. Maybe it's the 12th division in other books. Did you say there's no gas exchange at sub-segmental sub That is correct. There is no gas exchange yet. And the sub-segmental bronchi is the conducting? conducting Part of the conducting. Bronchi. Yeah, that is correct. You're still conducting airway. So let me write that down. Um, still conducting airways. I'll call it conducting zone. And I'll, and I'll tell you when it stops. Okay, so, so pretty much when you get to number 11, you transition from an airway called a bronchus to a bronchiole. These are the smaller airways. Bronchioles have no cartilage. And what you're seeing structurally is an increasing amount of smooth muscle and elastic tissue. That's what you want to know. I'll show you pictures of it later. Increasing amounts of smooth muscle and elastic fibers. The elastic fibers is important to know. You always want to think of the lungs as being like a balloon. You can inflate a balloon, but what happens when you like let the air out? It like collapses, like the elastic rubber wall of a balloon. You want your lungs to behave that way, to have this elastic recoil, so your lungs are not difficult to deflate. It's easy to take a breath out. You're not wheezing, right? So you start to see these structural changes when you get to bronchioles, and the bronchioles are considered. Um, they, they start here. Okay, let me get my notes out. It's only hard to visualize in the back, but you have these blue cartilage plates, but when you get to around the 11th division, there's no cartilage, and the smaller airways are called uh, the bronchioles. And they have several divisions. Let me refer to my notes real quick. So you kind of know. It's like 11 to 14, and about to 11 all the way to 16 divisions, it's all bronchioles. Mistake. Change that four to a one. It should be ten thousand, not forty thousand. Look at my notes wrong. Okay, because you have about ten thousand bronchi. When you get the bronchioles around down here, you have about twenty thousand. So you've about doubled your airways. Sorry about that. Twenty thousand versus ten thousand. Smallest bronchi could be about a millimeter. The bronchioles are about half that, so maybe a half millimeter in diameter. And the last division that are considered bronchioles, call them terminal bronchi. Well, um, call them terminal bronchioles at around here. I'm going to add the word terminal since it's the last one. And terminal doesn't mean it's the end of the bronchioles. That's the term used to describe the end of the conducting zone. So I'm going to draw my conducting zone arrow all the way to here, and I'm going to draw a line. So around division 16, call them terminal bronchioles, and it's the end of the conducting zone. And on the 
figure conducting these elements. Well, the, the number three bracket, and well, basically, right there, and it's this last bronchial division where they have the number five. They call it terminal bronchial. It's not the end of the bronchial. It's just the end of the conducting zone. Terminal means end, right? Because after that, you have a few more divisions of bronchioles, but they're going to have alveoli stuck to them, and that's where you're going to have the gas exchange. So let me start at the top of the board again. So we left off at 16. When you get to divisions 17, 18, and 19, you have a few divisions of what are called the respiratory bronchioles. numbers continue to increase. Maybe you have an eight with seven zeros after it. So now you're kind of up to about 80 million airways. So that's, that's kind of like a wild thing. 80 million, so you're having a lot of airways. They're much smaller, right? They're all packing your lungs. But, uh, the point is, these structures are kind of like the beginning of the respiratory zone. So 20, um, 21, 22, roughly. These bronchioles start to branch off into these structures called alveolar ducts. Now, let me advance the slide. Because now we're in the respiratory duct, which is number four. It's way down here. What, so what the figure, um, next figure I'm going to show you is that what we have in the lab. I don't want this to hide for you. It's one, on one of our models. Um, so it kind of qualifies for a lot of practical type of question asking. They have their own number system here. And uh, well, this is the respiratory zone. And I like this figure because it magnifies the two structural things I have you to note earlier. They're having increasing amounts of two things. Look in your notes. One is smooth muscle. And so these rubber band looking things are the smooth muscle. But the other thing are the elastic fibers. All of these like little black lines. And they're here, too, in the bronchioles. Those represent the elastic fibers, so you're supposed to notice that. Okay. Two key features there. And you can see that these respiratory bronchioles are studded with these alveoli. That's why I noted that there. That's where the actual gas exchange occurs. Okay, not in the bronchiole itself, but in the alveoli that kind of are poking at them right there. So anyways, 20, 20, 20, 21, 22 ish call them alveolar ducts. I branch off the, the bronchioles. What, what happens is the alveolar ducts, they kind of lead into our individual air sacs alveoli. This is the dead end. So I'll go 23. Some books go 24. So, you know, roughly, at 23, you have individual alveoli. 
singular is alveolus. Alveoli is plural. You got many of them. And so these are the tiny little air sacs. Their diameter might be 0 0.33 millimeters, microscopic. It's really the numbers that are impressive. It has something like um, as many as six or eight zeros after it. So that's as many as 600 million. Of these that are all alveolar stacks. So on the figure, there's some other structures, right? For example, number eight is called asinus, or no, alveolar sac, I'm sorry. Asinus is this whole thing. So how I think of it as um, structure number seven, this, this word here. I think of like many clusters of grapes. And I think of an alveolar sac, number eight structure, as kind of like one cluster of grapes, a sac of grapes. And I think of an alveolus as one grape. They've shown here an alveolar duct in the middle, and it's surrounded by individual alveoli. Okay, um, That's if you look at it this way. If usually a duct, it's a long structure. It's like um, a corridor, a long hallway. Imagine a long hallway, and along the hallway, you have all these rooms attached to the hallway. But the rooms have these sliding glass doors that open so you can get into the rooms. And the rooms represent alveoli. And the duct is the hallway, the alveolar duct. So alveolar ducts lead to um, individual alveoli. And so write these structures down. Yet you're supposed to know asinus. You're supposed to know alveolar sac, alveolar duct versus alveolus. I guess they all mean different things, right? I just described them. Again, which is one cluster of grapes, just one cluster of grapes. The sap. The sap, okay? So that's kind of how you can keep the terms straight in your head. And notice when you get down to it, the dead end, there's no smooth muscle. The smooth muscle is controlled at the bronchial level. Remember, that, that's where you can have control, constriction or dilation of the airways is at that level. And so that's important to know. No smooth muscle on the alveoli? Yes, so alveoli, let's go, no smooth muscle. All elastic fibers. So at the bronchioles, you should know that's where the ANS, the autonomic nervous system, you can control the smooth muscle for bronchial dilation or uh, constriction. Bronchodilation. Opposite, opposite would be bronchoconstriction. The sympathetic response is the dilation. It's also SYM. The parasympathetic response is constriction. I mean, not to the point of being asthmatic, but just regular um, resting, quiet breathing, like you're doing right now. You're not dilated as you are during exercise, but exercise will make this dilation, constriction, this parasympathetic. Now, that's the reverse for blood vessels, right? Yeah, it's not just I heard you. Yeah. That's a good point. Because Why not learn anything this so fast? Yeah, things are reversed in the human body, and this is wonderful because it makes sense, too. It's like for constriction, you want to constrict the blood vessels because you want to increase the systemic blood pressure. But for breathing, you want to increase airflow to your lungs. So it makes more sense to dilate the airways. So that way, you decrease. By increasing little r, you, you decrease big r, so there's less resistance to airflow. The air can fill your lungs in a sympathetic response. Can you say that again? That decreased, what did you say? 
increase, okay, when you dilate, increase the airway radius, decrease resistance to airflow. So the big R now is not to blood flow, but to airflow. I have another slide, we'll go into that a little bit more, but basically the idea is you control this constriction dilation at the bronchial level, not the bronchi level, they have that cartilage. Cartilage is good for keeping your airways open. All right, let's look at that same picture and talk about pulmonary circulation. Here what they've done is they've shown you the respiratory zone. So the blood vessel is kind of like all over it, so you can see how gas is exposed. So there's all this. And when you study the heart, you already studied the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. So now you're looking at pulmonary capillaries. So don't confuse pulmonary artery with bronchial artery. Okay, so bronchial artery That's just bringing oxygen-rich blood to the lung tissue and to the airways. The liver, O2-rich blood to airways slash lung tissue. But it's the, the pulmonary or branch of the pulmonary artery that's got the deoxygenated blood that needs to be oxygenated. Branch of pulmonary artery which is poor blood. Now I'm going to point it out. Look for the uh, branch, the pulmonary. Well, well, both of these are basically on the airway. On airway. Whatever, whatever airway you're talking about. Here it's bronchioles, and so it follows the, uh, there you go. So the blue is the branch of the pulmonary artery right on the airway, and you got the, um, the bronchial artery right there. Now the thing is, when you get down to the pulmonary capillaries where you have the gas exchange, the pulmonary veins are red. And the branches of the pulmonary veins are in these um, fibrous septum between the um, pulmonary lobules. And so the pulmonary veins are off the airway. And they're going to collect into the, the major pulmonary veins that return blood to the left heart. So in pulmonary capillaries, the blood picks up O2. That, that's the main exchange that we need to know now. Blood picks up O2. It'll dump CO2, pick up O2, and then the pulmonary veins or, or, or um, I said off the airways when I said I haven't said that before, but you, you should know. Yeah, eventually these are going to like um, form four pulmonary veins that deliver blood to the left atrium. Okay, so that. You should know if they're off the airway. So here's kind of some pictures and the colors on this model cut make it kind of easy. Um, so they call this one a uh, bronchial um, artery. So this is the uh, pulmonary artery there, and that's the pulmonary vein. Okay. So once again, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein. Oh, I'm sorry, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, and all the airway is bronchial artery this time. Okay. Now this model, you kind of have to like stare at it for a while. Um, there's one thing that students kind of miss, and it's right here. If you see an airway divide, and then it has a little thing stuck on it, call that a respiratory bronchial, right there. And if this is a respiratory bronchial, 
because it has the uh, little alveoli on it. What do you call the bronchial right before it? Terminal bronchial. It's like the last one before the respiratory zone. You can see all these like little individual alveoli. You have, they try to show pulmonary capillaries like this. They try to show those yellow things are supposed to be elastic fibers. So there's a lot of things that this model uh, uh, tries to show you. Um, one detail you might miss, do you see the thickness of the vessel wall versus this one? Now which one's thicker, the red or the blue? The blue is, and usually arteries have a thicker vessel wall. So pulmonary artery carrying deoxygenated blood, that's pulmonary vein, and that's a bronchial artery. Look at the thickness of the wall, it's a little bit thicker. All right, um, all right, so one thing is, I, I kind of raised my bronchial tree. So we went through all the divisions, and I tried to note for you along the way the diameter of the airways. And now you have as many as 600 million of the um, alveoli. But in terms of cross-sectional area, that's another important stat the physio people like to keep track of. Is cross-sectional area of this system. Because yesterday I brought up the idea of, no, not yesterday, but Friday, I brought up the idea of respiratory membrane. The idea of cross-sectional area is you want to provide a lot of respiratory membrane for gas exchange. That's the goal. call that CM square. Mm -hmm. And when you start off with one airway, you only have one, so the cross-sectional area is not very much. But when you get down to the, um, the end there, we got 600 million, you have over a million cross-sectional area. You get the alveoli. kind of did the math. This is about enough. If you were to take your lungs out of your body and somehow you could like flatten your lungs to the, uh, this cross-sectional area, it'd be enough to cover most of this classroom. Okay, now That's pretty effective. It's something like, um, you, could, you could do the math in, in terms of the square footage, like laying carpet on the floor. It's a lot. Okay, It's pretty remarkable that all of that is contained in your two lungs and in your chest. So you have a lot of area for gas exchange. Let's look at an illustration of the alveolar spaces. Okay, you have, um, well the things to note are the cell types. Type 1 cell, that's the main cell type. Basically, uh, what you have here is a simple squamous epithelium. And all the simple squamous cells that receive fresh air through those little holes are the type 1s. alveolar wall. So it's the main cell that's there. The air fills the spaces and it's lined with these cells. Now you have the, those green cells, type 2. Type 2 cells, well they're going to secrete surfactants. Surfactants are structures, they can basically break the surface tension of water. They 
comes through surface tension. Surface tension of water is important in a round structure. It makes it difficult to breathe. Imagine you have water. You do. Don't imagine. You do. You have water lining these microscopic spaces we'll call it alveoli. And water, represented by my blue line, has cohesive forces. Water molecules are attracted to each other, but when you're arranged in a circle, it creates a force in. And that force in can make your lungs difficult to inflate. It can make breathing difficult. In fact, this is the problem we have with premature um, births. They haven't started secreting the surfactants yet, so baby might have a tough time breathing. But what surfactants can do what your back is. Okay, imagine you can have a molecule that can kind of inter, intersperse between the individual water molecules. So say some surfactants. So I'm going to draw like little orange lines to symbolize surfactants and they're interspersing between water molecules, breaking the surface tension. So now water is broken. Now there's less water, there's less cohesive forces, so the force in is much less, so I'll draw smaller arrows to symbolize that. Okay, basically, this makes breathing easier when you break surface tension. Okay, these are the same surfactants in detergents when you wash your clothes. Surfactants, they decrease the viscosity of water, and they make water better able to penetrate the fabric to get the stains out. Okay, you also have, well, okay, with well, the green cell, basically type, type 2. You also have macrophages to keep things sterile. Um, but they don't have a number, they just call them macrophages. So I'll just put my abbreviation for macrophages. They're present, the type 1, type 2 macrophages. Those are the cell types. And the other thing you should study from this figure is the anatomy of the, you know, the respiratory membrane. That they have illustrated right here. Gas is supposed to go across that. So when you study the respiratory membrane, note, note all the cell types. So when you got the type 1 cell, flat squamous cell, the nucleus, you have the pulmonary capillary. Well, anyway, it's the endothelial cell of the pulmonary capillary. them is a fused, um, it's a connective tissue that fuses them together, a fused basement membrane. So I'll just kind of like blue for that, fused basement membrane.
the whole thing, call it respiratory memory. And that is the membrane in the alveolar spaces where gases can come across. You can get O2 into the blood and dump CO2 into the space. So the blood is on this side of the uh, membrane. Okay. So the blood flowing will pick up O2 and it'll dump CO2 into the alveolar space. Blood alveolar space. You want to get the CO2 into the alveolar space so you can get it out with your next breath out. Uh, here it is on back of this figure. So this figure has a lot. It's got the actual lung tissue. It's got that little picture there we looked at it of the respiratory zone and mass labor. All the hydrogen. And on the back, you have the alveolar space. And then it's, um, you got you to know what you're looking for. You've got to be able to identify type 1, type 2 cells. they got two cells right there. The flatter cell is type 1. The more round cell is type 2. The star looking things are macrophages. So again, type 1, type 2, more round cell. Remember, the squamous cells are the alveolar wall cells, so the flatter cell is always going to be type 1. Here's a picture of lung tissue, and uh, this is from our collection. I just kind of took pictures and made it easy on myself. I just digitally inserted it in my own lecture. If you see, it looks like there's a bit of a epithelial wall. That's going to be bronchial. The branches, okay. Now I'm in the hallway. What did I call the hallway? Alveolar duct. Okay, so if you see any kind of a thickened wall on this slide, we're deep in the lung tissue. The only thing you got is at the bronchial <laughs> level. So bronchial bronchial, uh, when you, this is bronchial, but you transition to alveolar duct, okay, anything that looks like a hallway, um, I'm going to call alveolar duct. If I have an area that kind of looks like this, it's more like an alveolar sac. If I point to a little dead end, I'm going for, in terms of identification, alveolus, okay. Uh, let's see here. All right, here's a closer up picture. So we think this is alveolar duct. What is this whole thing? Alveolar sac. What if we went to that, or just that, or just that, or that? Okay. I'm going for alveoli, okay, or just alveolus, singular. So that's kind of what you can see in ours. I wanted to give a close-up picture of bronchial. This is the wall of bronchial. All you notice is the epithelium, which is like a cuboidal ET with sparse cilia and, and smooth muscle. Let me write that down for you. Bronchial wall. Close to respiratory membrane. Thinner than this. Yeah. So the bronchial wall, which is this, notice you got smooth muscle. So the epithelium I described as cuboidal ET with cilia. That should be thorough, simple cuboidal. That's basically what you see here. I'm just describing this. And I wanted, I wanted to put it side by side with the trachea um, so you can kind of see the difference. The tracheal wall is much thicker. And um, the epithelium, we already noted all this stuff for the trachea. 
It's a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium with goblet cells. And there's also a submucosa, an adventitia. We talked about that already. And so the, the, bron the bronchial wall is much thinner. But the respiratory membrane is much thinner than that. So you've really thinned out uh, the airway wall. And you get all the way down to the alveolar spaces to the respiratory membrane. Right, so to go back macro, let's just look at the entire lung organ if you were to remove them from the chest. We have models where they're kind of in the chest with the heart, but if you just were to remove them, you should be able to tell left from right lung by itself as an organ. That's how they're named. You should be able to identify those. Now the lobes are easy to see on models of real lungs because there's a fissure, a deep groove that separates it. And those lobes are separated by one oblique fissure. So no. The oblique fissure describes kind of its oblique angle and how it runs. So above the fissure, superior, and then below the fissure, inferior lobes. And then for the right lung, we have superior, middle, inferior lobes. Three lobes are separated by two fissures, a horizontal fissure and an oblique fissure. superior lobe from the lobes below it. This one down here is the oblique fissure, runs more obliquely. Okay. So they call this the, this the chest surface. It's the part of the lung that's stuck to the chest wall. So that's why they use this term, costal surface. So that, that pertains to both lungs, the surfaces. The so lungs have costal surface. Costal, that means long, costal. Costal surface, it's the side of the lung stuck to chest wall. Now if you turn the lungs inward, um, it's the mediastinal surface. And that's where you see the helum of the lung. Helum usually describes the place where things enter and exit an organ. So the mediastinal surface. The mediastinum is a, is a cavity space inside the thoracic, within the thoracic cavity. Okay, you can look that up if you want. Mediastinal surface. So this surface of the lung contains helum of the lung. Now, when you look at the helum of a lung, be able to identify the airway, the bronchus, right? Also be able to identify the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. One delivering blood, one is collecting blood to take to the heart. Pulmonary artery, 
as well as pulmonary vein. And this is another way you can tell if you're looking at left or right. Well, one thing you can see is you can see the impression of the heart on the left lung. Here's the impression of the heart. You can see the artery kind of like going over, right? Going over there. Here, um, on this side, well, one thing you can see is that here, the pulmonary artery is over the airway. That's true of the left lung. The pulmonary artery is over the airway. That's one way you can tell your left lung. Pulmonary artery is superior to over the airway. But on the um, right lung, it's what we usually see. That the pulmonary artery is behind the airway. It's posterior to it. So those are kind of the clues you could use to see identify left from right lung. And this kind of like gets into uh, the next topic we want to tackle is the respiratory mechanics. I said that you have the costal surface of the lung that's stuck to the chest wall. Let's talk about that. That's very important. This kind of gets into this topic of res respiratory mechanics. We talk about the pleural cavities. So again, I I think I've said this before, there's the three P's of anatomy. There's the um, pleura, the peritoneum, the pericardium. So this is one of those P's. And these membranes surround the lungs. The pleura. picture. I, I put in a bunch of pictures because there's a lot of stuff I want to uh, cover here. Let me just read what's on my slides first. What I wrote here in this first point is that the interaction of lung and chest walls is not by direct attachment, but through the pleural cavity. So when I say lung is stuck, stuck to the chest, there's a very thin pleural cavity that does separate. But that cavity is fluid filled and it separates the parietal and visceral pleura. So what I like about this figure is they take a little bit of lung wall, chest wall, and they blow it up. So when I say lung is stuck to the chest, I'm not wrong. But there's these little pleural membranes that do separate them. So let's note the pleura, pleural membranes. The pleural membranes include parieto parietal pleura, visceral pleura. Well, if you look at the picture, the parietal pleura, that's the pleura that surrounds the lungs that's stuck to the inside of the chest wall. Lines inside of the chest wall. The chest wall I also refer to as the thorax or thoracic cage, your rib cage. Your chest wall is your rib cage. Your chest is ribs and intercostal muscle mostly. Okay. Well, anyways, separating the parietal from the visceral pleura is a pleural cavity. It's a tiny, thin, fluid-filled space. fluid-filled space, um, well, in that cavity, think of it as a seal. It's keeping the lung wall stuck to the chest wall, but because, let me read my second bullet point, because the lungs and thoracic wall pull away from each other on opposite sides of the pillow cavity, 
the intrapleural pressure is less than atmospheric pressure. So basically what I'm saying is there's a negative pressure inside this tiny little space. This fluid filled space has a negative pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. start to introduce these terms, students start to get nervous. We're talking about pressure, negative, or atmospheric pressure. You learned about atmospheric pressure, right? In chemistry, A, like with barometric pressure. Uh, basically, here, that's you, little stick figure. And you live on Earth, you walk on the ground. There's a column of air over you. It's called the atmosphere. Imagine you living under a column of air called the atmosphere is pushing down on your body surface. In some books, they call this pressure on BS, body surface. I and mean, we're not aware of it, right? When you live here, we're not something we walk around feeling. But it's a pressure, and um, usually at sea level, it's something like, okay. So what I'm saying is, if the pressure in the if the intrapleural cavity, the intrapleural pressure, is less than that, it's going to be less than 760. <laughs> intrapleural pressure. I usually abbreviate that in this lecture, PIP. Intrapleural pressure. Okay. PIP will be something like 756. A lot of times what I'll do is, I, I won't even say 756, I'll just call our 760, our barometric pressure, or atmospheric pressure, I'll just zero it. And I'll say, um, I'll say that 756, I'll, I'll just say it's negative four. And the units are always millimeters of mercury. Okay, so if I refer to it either way, you should know. Okay. Now, it does change with breathing, this negative pressure, but it remains negative throughout the breathing cycle. So that's the pleural cavity. It's fluid filled. Um, and then you have the visceral pleura. The visceral pleura, that's on the lung tissue. It's, it's like the parietal, no, sorry, it's like the pericardial pleura that you remove, the visceral pericardium. Remember I gave you bonus points for that? This is exactly like that, except it's on the lungs. All right, let's move away from this slide. Before, before we do, let's look at the other pictures I included. Now those plural spaces, on this picture here from the atlas, the lungs are the pink lungs. But wherever it has blue, that's pleural space without the lung tissue. So you can see that the pleura occupy more um, space in the lung cavities you know, than the lungs themselves. Here from this picture, it's a good analogy of how the pleura surround the lungs. Pretend your lung is a lollipop, and you immerse it in a water balloon. And so basically, your lung is completely surrounded by the pleura. Okay. So a trick question in anatomy is we say, what's contained in the pleural cavity. And students always want to say long, but it isn't. What's in the pleural cavity? Fluid. That's it. Okay. The lungs are in the thoracic cavity. On this slide, um, if you rupture that seal in the pleural cavity, say bullet wound, knife wound, and air is introduced, you're going to like um, fill that vacuum, and then you break the seal, and there's nothing keeping lung wall stuck to the chest wall. So they call that secondary atelectasis. Fancy words for saying collapse wall.
injury. Ruptures the parietal, um, the parietal pleura. And then, let's say, for example, air enters pleural cavity. If air enters the pleural cavity, they call that a pneumothorax. Pneumo means air. Other things could enter it, say if blood enters it, they call that a hemothorax. I imagine blood and air could enter. But anyways, the point is, you rupture the seal, the, uh, the PIP, it equilibrates with atmospheric pressure. If PIP was, say, on average, negative four prior to injury, what is it after? I always ask this on tests and quizzes, and students always miss it. If I say it equilibrates, what does it equilibrate to? Negative four, zero. You broke the seal, lung collapses. I put a zero there, I'm trying to say PIP equilibrates with PATM, that's pressure of the atmosphere, which is our 760, our zero point. Okay, so then lung collapses and you push out all the air there, the lung is very difficult to inflate. You can remove air and uh, <laughs> fluids, you have to insert a chest tube. You know, there is a, a medical emergency situation where it's called tension pneumothorax. There's even one you can look up, it's called tension pneumothorax with rightward shift of the heart. Now, um, tension pneumothorax is different from pneumothorax. Tension refers to pressure. In tension pneumothorax, pressure is building. Okay, so usually when you have a hole in your chest, well, obviously you can see why a hole in your chest is a problem. But um, as you breathe with a hole in your chest, air can enter, but air can also escape. But in tension pneumothorax, you rupture the membrane in a way that creates a flap. A flap where when you take a breath in, it, the flap opens and air enters the chest. When you take a breath out, it closes and air is trapped. So you keep breathing, all you're doing is letting air in and that's it. So pressure builds inside the portal in this space. And I wish they had, the, I had a picture of the heart here. You're going to crush the heart because it's like air is like being trapped inside the chest. And the heart, it becomes difficult to pump blood. It, it can't fill with blood because you're, you're crushing it. Okay, so you might see elevated pulse. Oh, you'll see other things. I mean, uh, the anatomy here is if you rupture it, air gets trapped, tension pneumothorax. But any air entering the pleural cavity or anything is called something pneumo, hemothorax. And always remember this, you've equilibrated, okay? So for example, if it's an emergency situation um, and you have to do it in the field, I've seen paramedic students do they just take it, they call it needle decompression. They just take a needle and they just drop it, they poke it in the intercostal space. You just you know, I, I've asked them, well, how do, you, how do you know you've gone deep enough with your needle? You should hear a pop, right? Because you're letting air escape or, or fluid will like squirt out or something to relieve the, the pressure that's building up there. When you get to the hospital, the, the doctor can insert a chest tube or something. You can try to reinflate the lung. Oh, wait, here's a picture from the book that kind of shows it. Knife wound. 
rupture parietal pleura. Here they show rupture of the visceral pleura, maybe spontaneous, but they don't show the lung collapsing. Okay? It, it's a rupture of the parietal pleura where, where fluid is entered. I guess you can have a collapsed lung with this too. They don't just show it in this example. I mean, I, I even had a student in this class. I remember one here at 430. She had a really bad cough. And I remember the sound of her cough was very noticeable. It was just a really bad cough. And I remember when she took me to 431, the cough went away. And I happened to overhear her. I won't identify her or anything. But I overheard her saying, yeah, I had a spontaneous collapsed lung because of the cough, bad coughing. And so I mean, just coughing can do it. There, there are many causes that you can look up for this collapsed lung. But look here. You can pull a break, right? It's zero on the outside, it's zero on the inside of the parietal, uh, of the intrapleural space, the pleural cavity, and you have a collapsed lung. The problem is, it's difficult to inflate a collapsed lung, right? So if you evacuate this area, that'll reinflate the lung. It's kind of like if you have difficult blowing up a balloon. You blow really hard, you, and you, you finally get air in it. So imagine the balloon is half blown up. It's easier to blow air into a half blown up balloon than a balloon that's completely deflated, right? It's the same with your lung. The lung is like a balloon. So muscles can help breathing. Let's call this the muscles of inspiration. Mostly diaphragm. of inspiration include primarily the diaphragm. Now the diaphragm is a muscle that when it contracts, it flattens. It's a big dome shape. And when it contracts, it flattens. see on, well especially here, that all the muscle fibers insert, they all come up in a circle and insert on this central tendon here. All the white part is considered central tendon. Muscle fibers insert, but just not the central tendon. out because the diaphragm is flattening, pushing down on your viscera so your belly comes out a little bit, right? Now there's stuff that comes out of the diaphragm from abdominal cap, from thoracic abdominal cap, we can talk about that later. Uh, well, let's talk about it now, I'll show them right here. Look at these three holes. One, two, three. The three holes allow for three things to come through. Aorta, esophagus, Inferior vena cava. So you should be able to identify. Uh, you know what is? Esophageal hiatus. Cable opening. And they're happening at different levels. The aortic hiatus is the lowest, at, at around T12. The esophageal hiatus is kind of like mid-level, T10. And the highest opening is the cable opening at, at around T8. And so for aorta, esophagus, inferior vena cava, they're all going there, going through those places. 
So I'll put ab aorta. When the aorta goes through there, it changes its name from thoracic aorta to abdominal aorta. And you have esophagus. And you have inferior vena cava. On this picture here, we can also see our other muscle of inspiration, the external intercostal. Basically, that elevates ribs. So when you breathe in, it's an active process, you must recruit muscles. And so it's important to know the innervation. Well, I do know the one for the, di the diaphragm. The innervation of the diaphragm is the phrenic nerve. Remember C3, 4, 5, the diaphragm alive, phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is the nerve that innervates the diaphragm. Okay. And so inspiration, active process. Active means recruit the muscles of inspiration. I'll just say recruit muscles. I already said the action of diaphragm, it flattens when you take a breath in. The whole goal is you're expanding the chest cavity. The intercostals, they elevate ribs. So when you do that, it's kind of like, um, imagine these are little bucket handles, it's like lifting the bucket handle over. Show you this picture, the whole bucket, bucket handle analogy. When you elevate ribs, it's like lifting the handle of a, of a bucket, so ever so slightly. So when all the ribs elevate, you're increasing, um, you're increasing the thoracic volume laterally. So elevate ribs, they call that the bucket handle movement. Increase thoracic volume laterally from side to side. Increase thoracic volume laterally. When you increase your thoracic volume, you're going to draw air into the lungs for inspiration. But the other thing they show here has to do with the sternum, not necessarily the ribs. The sternum has an angle. Right there, it's called the sternal angle. Sternal. At the sternal angle, you have pump handle movement. <coughs> sternal angle, you can observe pump handle movement. That allows you to increase the thoracic volume also front to back, from anterior to posterior. Increase thoracic volume anterior to posterior. Front to back. So your rib cage gets bigger side to side, front to back. That draws air into your lungs. And so when you, I kind of talk about this in the uh, study guide, I think. So bucket handle, pump handle, I talk about that. Well, let's take a break here. We'll come back at around 10.30. And we'll uh, continue on with the slides.